finally. Okay, we finally got the stream working. Sorry, guys. It just wouldn't work. I had to restart my computer, and here we are. Okay, so um, for those of you who are new here watching the replay, we are here every week, every Sunday, um, 11.30 to about 1.30 or 2 o'clock California time. Today we're starting at 11.45 because the stream would not start, but here we are. So all seems to be good. Definitely have to get StreamYard set up so I can avoid this problem. Um, but StreamYard doesn't let me record unless I pay, so I'm going to have to look into that. I can't really afford any extra expenses right now. Um, speaking of which, I still have to change my italki class prices, so let's do that while we wait for some people to get in here. Um, do, 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 changing class prices. You're going to go down to, well, I guess I have to do some math for that, so I'll handle that later. Um, I will change that right after the live stream. Um, yeah, I do have one comment that I'm going to have to address. Um, that I said I would address in the live stream today. So let's go to comments. Once again, from uh, Stupidity Delivery Service. OK. Um, <clears throat> so this person says, um, I've been listening to tons of speech since my release from my prison of vowel length, um, which is based on previous live streams. I, uh, we were talking about how the length of the vowel doesn't change uh, before a voice or voiceless consonant. Um, he says, now I can hear 90% of speech. Huge improvement. Very good. But something still stands in my way, not letting me hear everything. I could hear everything only once after your explanation of vowel length. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I feel it has to do with the stress. It seems to me I could hear everything at that brief moment of enlightenment only because I could hear the stress itself and distinguish content words from everything else. But the thing is, I wasn't trying to hear the stress. I was just hearing it. And now after trying to hear it consciously, I realize I lost any ability to do so. Um, okay. Things like that can happen. So the questions here, uh, we have three questions. Number one, first of all, there are some sounds we widely use in unstressed syllables, which are, and then they listed these three sounds. This is the first point I want to address. So this person says that these three sounds are widely used in unstressed syllables. The schwa, yes, it is the single most common sound in the language because it is used so much in reductions. Um, and because it's the center of gravity in American English for the mouth posture, so that also makes sense. Um, for e, that is also an extremely common reduction sound. Um, but e, which is hard for me to do in isolation, that symbol, the first symbol, it looks like a lowercase e, uh, that symbol is the start of the diphthong a, and that is not uh, a common reduction sound. Um, at least as far as I know. E, which the IPA would, it would look sort of like a, a backwards three, that is uh, somewhat commonly used as a reduction sound, um, but not the start of A, because the start of A, um, although, yeah, we can cut the diphthong, and instead of saying day, we can say day, day, that's, that's okay, but um, aside from that, we don't really perceive it that way, and we don't really use it outside of the diphthong, as far as I'm aware. We don't use it in isolation. So that's the first point. Hello, Stupidity Delivery Service. I'm answering your question. You might want to rewind a little bit. Um, I'm addressing the first point, which is that the E sound, uh, at the start of A diphthong, is not really used as a reduction sound, as far as I'm aware. Um, there may be places for that, but it's the E sound, not the E sound. Um, it would be the IPA symbol that looks like a backwards three. So. That's the first thing. Um, OK, further, uh, unstressed sounds are, so the, back to the comment here, unstressed sounds are also short and quiet. Yes. Um, I notice you say unstressed sounds. 
it doesn't matter. Don't think of stressed sounds and unstressed sounds. Think of a sound being stressed and a sound being unstressed because all sounds in American English, all sounds in English can be stressed or unstressed. Technically speaking, the only one that can't be stressed is the schwa, but that is what I would call the true reduced schwa, the little uh sound. Uh, but if we consider the full range of the schwa, uh, uh, and then the upside down B, uh, or something like that, I can, uh, it's hard for me to do that in isolation because we perceive it as uh. Um, but if you take that full range of the, the reality of the schwa in American English, then it can technically be stressed, but specifically linguistically uh, is never stressed. Um, that little technicality aside, any sound, I don't care if it's e, 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 a, 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 o, u, i, a, um, r, or, o, okay, any sound can be stressed and unstressed. It depends on the exact word or syllable that we're talking about. Um, but there are certain sounds like it and a uh, that are commonly used as reduction sounds. Um, so, uh, and are also commonly used just in unstressed syllables, like in about, the uh is not a reduction. It's just, we naturally use the uh in that, uh, for the first syllable of that word. So that that's true, but don't think of sounds that are unstressed. There's just sounds that can be used stressed or unstressed, right? All sounds can be used stressed or unstressed. Uh, but how can I hear that the same sounds are stressed in fast speech? Okay. For example, I came across a phrase lately, men must be free to do what they believe. Pronounced pretty fast. Okay. So men must be free to, I'm trying to say it really, really quickly. Men must be fast. Men must, men must be fast or fast. See, I'm thinking fast. I'm not even saying it right. Mom, men must be free. Men must be free to do what they believe. Men must be free. Men must be free. Men must be free. Okay. Um, the word men contains the e eh sound. No, it does not. No, it does not. It contains the e eh sound. The e eh sound. So that's the no, hello, Hercules. Welcome. Um, I'm trying to address a uh, some comments in a recent question. So let me know if you have any questions, Hercules. Um, but uh, yeah, it's the eh sound again, that sort of backwards three looking IPA symbol it looks kind of more like a capital E than a lowercase e. Um, that is the sound in men. Okay. Um, it's men. Um, if you use the uh, the lowercase e, if you use this sound, um, which again, we don't really use in isolation, it's part of a, but if you were to do that, it would sound more like main, 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 instead of men, men, men. Okay. We do not say men that immediately just trying to say it that way. I immediately just gave myself a very strong accent. Um, so, okay. Uh, so it doesn't contain the eh sound, it contains the eh sound, uh, which is a pretty light and subtle sound to my ear. Uh, and we can reduce the upside down V. So this sound here, just so everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, if you know IPA, which as I teach it, remember is the fully open end of the range of what I call the schwa. It's part of that same sound within the context of American English. Um, and we can reduce the uh, in must to schwa, that is true, right? It's part of the full range of sound. Um, so if you're saying the word more clearly, must, must, you must do that. Uh, uh, uh. But if I'm speaking more lazily and or more quickly, we're not going to take the time to open all the way down into a, uh, or it's again, hard for me to do that in isolation. Um, we're going to probably go either into the full center of gravity, um, and it'll still be clear, uh, uh, or we're going to reduce it all the way to a true actual reduced schwa, uh, must, must, must. Okay. Um, anywhere in there is fine. Uh, it's just the faster and more lazily you speak, the more likely we're going to use one of the more, uh, closed points in that range. Um, okay. So my question is, is there any way to hear that the word men is stressed in relation to must and fast speech? Well, in a sentence like this, one thing I'll point out first, um, and I'll go ahead and paste the sentence here so we know what we're talking about. Hello, everybody. Welcome for joining, joining. Uh, I was referring to the backwards three. Oh, okay, I see. 
well, that, that's just not accurate because that's a different IPA symbol. That, that's why that's confusing. <laughs> um, Dungeon Master, welcome. You changed your name again, I see. <laughs> okay. Alan is also here. Um, okay, so Alan, I'm in the middle of uh, answering a, a recent comment. Um, so I will get to you very soon. Just hold tight, uh, but welcome. So this is the sentence we're talking about. Men must be free to do what they believe. Now, in this type of sentence, um, it's very, it, it, you don't have to. It depends on the exact context and, and what you're trying to emphasize. Um, but this type of sentence, uh, it, it would be very easy uh, to give extra emphasis to must, like men must be free to do what they believe. Uh, in which case, both men is still stressed, right? But must in that case uh, become stressed. Um, usually must is, um, uh, it's a modal verb, so modal verbs aren't stressed by, by default. Um, and, uh, but because must, right, it's a very strong word, it's like, like have to, like, you know, and you can easily give that extra stress, say they must be free to do what they believe, in which case you're giving it stress, you're giving it the focus, and so now it's actually more stress than men uh, because it has the focus. Um, so that, that's one thing, and that should stand out pretty well if you shift the focus word. Um, but your question is, is there any way to hear that the word men is stressed in relation to must and fast speech? So the thing about fast speech, there there's things related to, especially sounds, because a lot of sounds can kind of not work the way you expect. Certain linking uh, might happen that otherwise might not happen in really fast speech so it depends on exactly how fast we're talking um but if i say okay uh if i just take that first part if i say men must be free okay you should hear that there men must be free men must be free okay men must be free men must be free men must be free now we're not taking as much time everything's getting a little condensed so it even to my ears, it's relatively a little bit more difficult to kind of hear exactly what the stress is doing there. Um, but part of ear training, this is something I haven't talked about too much because I've spent a lot of time on the sounds. Um, ear training applies to various different levels and aspects of, um, of speech. So there's obviously the individual sounds. Can you hear the difference between E and E, you know, E and A? Et cetera, et cetera. That's bottom level. You got to be able to work that out first. Um, then there's okay. Can you you know break out the words in the flow of speech as part of your training? Um, that's something that just with lots of listening, you'll your brain will start to sort things out. Um, the pronunciation your training will directly help and amplify that, but eventually your brain will work that out. Um, but speed is also a factor. So if you're used to listening to people who speak very clearly and enunciate everything, like maybe a teacher in a class might, and that's all your exposure, then when you talk to a native, you're going to get lost because natives speak faster than that. If you run into somebody who's, who's speaking extra fast and you're used to, say, normal speed, again, you're going to have trouble. So if I start speaking like this, you might have trouble following me. Okay. Um, that's another extension of ear training. You have to specifically, which again, eventually your ears will will probably kind of start figuring things out, but um, you can attack that directly by spending some time listening to really fast speech and just training your ears to better separate out the words, separate out the stress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Another thing here, again, provided that we're not giving any special emphasis or focus to must, this is going to be very abstract and probably not useful. You want to feel it. <laughs> we always want to want to try to feel it. Um, and in this case, it's not the most useful advice. But if you know that it, at a slower speed, that's how the stress pattern is going to work, the stress pattern is not going to change, right? Um, so, and it's not about the rule, like, oh, this word is stressed because it's a content word and this word is not stressed because it's a function word. It's like, literally, okay, men must be free. Men must be free. Men must be free. It, 
if, if you can feel that at, at a slower speed, just get used to feeling it at a faster speed. Get more exposure to that faster speed. Um, get the language into you. Okay. Um, it's not about the rules. It's not always about like knowing that this is this way and this is that way. You want to feel it. You want to get the patterns, the, the flow of the intonation, the flow of the stress into your, your body. Um, uh, they're about the same length because pronounced fast. Um, are they the same length though? Um, and they both contained sounds which are used in unstressed syllables. Uh, okay, so again, going back to stress versus unstress, uh, that is completely irrelevant because all sounds can be used in stress or unstress syllables. That has nothing to do with anything. Um, so you say that they're about the same length. If men is a content word that is stressed, a single syllable content word, and must is a single syllable function word that's not stressed, by default, they are not going to be the same length. Right, because remember, a stressed syllable is louder, longer, usually higher in pitch. An unstressed syllable is shorter, quieter, usually lower in pitch. One thing that might be throwing you off here is the M's, right? So they both start in M, and we can actually shift the N in men into the next M. And we don't have to say men must, we can say mem must, mem must, especially if we're speaking quickly. If you're, spe if you're enunciating more, it doesn't work. If, if that rule doesn't apply, but in normal speed speech and a fast speed speech, um, that does work. Um, men must, right? Men must be free. Men must be free. Men must, men must, men must, men must. Because partially because, well, I guess we're, we don't have to say the T, but I can see how they can seem like a similar length. Um, this is an interesting point. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that must is the same length. Um, men must be free. Men must be free. Men must be, men must be free. There's something, there's something interesting going on there, but, um, the, the, you say, because pronounced fast, the, the speed has nothing to do with the length of the sound, right? If something is, is longer because it's stressed, at faster speed, it gets condensed because we're spending less time on it. If something is shorter because it's unstressed, at faster speed, it will also get condensed, okay? To the point where we start dropping things. That's one of the why really fast speech starts breaking things because the things that were already small, some of them start actually just disappearing. Um, uh, okay, uh, I can be sure that a word is stressed due to aspiration, for example. Eh, if we're talking about a a voiceless uh, stop consonant, p, k, or t, yes, you can be sure. Um, other sounds don't really aspirate, um, regardless of if it, there's stress or not. Uh, but there are only some consonants we aspirate, so it doesn't work here. So yeah, it's true. I notice I have the same problem with the words let, fill, get, uh, and so on. I just can't catch them because I can't initially realize they're the content or stressed words in fast speech. Um, so this, again, comes down to ear training. You have to train your ears to, because when we're speaking really quickly, the stress is there. But obviously, we're not spending time on it. It's just part of the language, right? When we shift the focus word and spend more time on a particular thing, obviously we're 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 probably gonna slow down a little bit, maybe we're gonna really make it stand out. That's very easy. But just the normal stress and the flow of speech, especially when we have like these, you know, like falling intonation patterns and stuff that can make it harder to hear the stress, um, like at the end, right? Um you, you just have to get used to hearing what is stressed and what's not, okay? Um, which I know is very vague and not the most useful advice, but that's what it comes down to. Again, it's ear training, ear training, ear training, ear training, and then shadowing for the production, right? Um, okay. Is much easier in slow speech because they become a little longer in this case. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I have to say about that. I know it's not necessarily the the most uh, satisfying answer, but keep training your ears. 
um, get used to that that structure of stress and unstress. Remember that the focus word, whether it's shifted or not, if it's just the default focus word, that's gonna stand out a little bit more um, than the other stress words. Uh, it's it's more about making or noticing that um, the the stress words feel a little fuller usually um, where the unstressed words or unstressed syllables uh, they're they, they don't feel as full they're smaller right uh, when we speed everything up that distinction gets harder to notice but it's still there um, because again why do we stress the content words because they're content <laughs> they're the actual information the grammar doesn't usually matter that much um, they just kind of link the sentence together. Um, not that it's not important, but um, it's not content. So. so focus on the stuff of the sentence, especially the nouns, but nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. Build your ear to hear uh, what's going on with that word or, you know, train your, if it's pro a production problem, train yourself to um, to match that in the way that a native would through shadowing. Okay, qu question two, there's two more shorter questions here. Um, so we're almost done here. Two, uh, in one of your old videos, you said that if a word consists of more than one syllable, there will always be a stress syllable. Yes, if you have two syllables in a word, it doesn't matter what kind of word it is, one of those syllables will be stressed guaranteed. It's one of the few 100% rules in English. Um, it pretty much works with the word about, for example, yes. Uh, first syllable is unstressed, uh, second syllable is stressed, bout. Uh, but what about the word because? I hardly ever hear it in its fully aspirated form. Uh, same with other multisyllable words. Okay, so in the case of because, 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 because. Okay, remember it's relative. It's relative. So because might not stand out. Uh, might not seem to stand out as much, but within the word itself, the cause, because, because, because. Okay. Now notice here, you say it's not aspirated, right? Yeah. So we was we would think like a K at the start of a stress syllable it should be k, k, right? K, like if I say cause, 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 we can hear that k, k, k. Uh, I don't say because, because, because. Um, in this particular word, uh, I think this is a bit of a special case. Uh, because the, the the word because is number one, it's so super common. It's a very, very, very common word. Um, and number two, it is a function word. Um, so because it's so common, because it's a function word, uh, we probably don't push that stress or the, not the stress. We probably don't push that, that aspiration out as much in this particular case. And it's sort of a, a special case. Um, right. We know English likes to have exceptions. <laughs> um if you say with same with multi, other multi-syllable words, you'd have to give me examples. I have no idea. Uh, number three, what about the words here, now, then, this, that, and so on? When are they supposed to be reduced and when are they content words? Okay, now, so you say, when are they supposed to be reduced? That's not necessarily the right question because remember, just because something is unstressed, it doesn't mean it's reduced. So I, I want to make sure that's not a confusion here. Unstressed does not mean reduced. Unstressed does not mean reduced. Reduced reduction is a a changing or dropping of a sound usually because it's not stressed not all unstressed words or syllables have reductions right two is a common one that does have a reduction two becomes ta a the article a car a car becomes a the becomes the these are very very common ones um or becomes er okay uh But something that is simply unstressed, like two, if I fully pronounce the word two and I don't reduce the ooh to uh, it's not stressed, right? Like if I say, uh, I want to go to the beach, I want to go to the beach. Okay, I can even say the, the beach. Now we probably want to do that. It sounds a little bit weird if I'm trying to do it for all the twos and, and the does, and, and, but potentially it could come out that way. 
uh, or at least one of those twos, I want to go to the beach. I want to go to the beach. Okay. You could do that. It sounds um, sort of like you're you're emphasizing the statement, like I want to. Okay. And then the stress is still on the one, not the two. Um, if I were to stress to, I would actually say I want to go to the beach. And you, that would be very strange. You really need a special reason to stress to. So just because you, you don't reduce doesn't mean it's stressed. Okay. Stress and reduction are different things. Um, so when are these words uh, right here, now, this, then, that, when are they supposed to be unstressed? And when are they content words? Um, also keep in mind a reduction can happen in a stressed word. It's it's not necessarily supposed to happen in a stress word. It's much more common in an unstressed word. But get, for example, G-E-T, fully enunciated is get. It's, it uses the eh sound, but it's most commonly pronounced with e, eh, not e, eh, get. So it's actually reduced to the e eh sound, but it's still stressed. Um, this is a difficult question that I don't have an exact answer for at the moment uh, because I know this is a problem group. Um, and I'm going to eventually get to sorting that out because it, it kind of depends on how the words are being used. That is an easy case to point out. If we use that to mean that over there, it's sort of, it's pointing to the content. And so it's, there's probably going to be stress there. But if I say, I think that he's right, that use of that, we usually don't even say at all. It's just completely gone. Um, and so if you do say it, I think that he's right the that that links between two is clear function content uh, or content function um, grammar uh, it, it would not be stressed um, you say like I think that he's right and it's kind of weird so uh, I'm gonna put that one on hold especially since I've already spent so much time on this question here hopefully that that helps um, if you have any clarifications, further questions based on all that, uh, we can go into that. But at the end of the day, my biggest advice that I can give to you is uh, get the language into you. Get how the flow of the language feels into you. This takes lots of exposure, um, especially at those faster speeds. At the end of the day, that's always going to be the solution. Um, explanations, if they're good, uh, or hacks, right? These things can be very, very useful. It can help speed up the process, make the process easier. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I could have all the best hacks in the world. I could have all the best advice in the world and say this, 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 this. Um, and maybe it'll make you learn 10 times faster. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to input exposure. Okay. And the more you have, the better, the more you have, the better. Okay. There's no escaping that you have to spend time with the language. Now, when you're spending time with the language, you can do that in a very inefficient way by not really paying attention. Okay. Um, and then you can do that in an efficient way, depending on your target. So if you're trying to focus on grammar, you're probably going to pay attention to actually noticing how the structure of the language is used. If you're spending time focusing on sounds or stress or things related to pronunciation, right, you can tune your ears to pay attention to any of those details, the particular sounds, right? Try to notice, say, E and A, you can hear in isolation, but you can't hear, they don't, it doesn't really stand out in the flow of speech. Well, tune your ears to that when you're listening to speech. Get lots of exposure and listen specifically for those sounds. Okay. Target what you practice is what improves. Target what you want to improve. Okay. Um, could be intonation or could be stress like we're talking about here. If you tune your ears specifically to that thing and you get lots of exposure while you're trying to notice that thing, it's going to help. You're giving your brain a target and it's going to eat that food. Okay. But it needs the food. Without the food, there's nothing. It doesn't matter what it's targeted on. Okay. Um, so I think that kind of might be where you're at right now. Um, realizing that the vowel length doesn't doesn't really change uh, um, between or you know before like a, a 
uh, voice or voiceless consonant and stuff like that, um, right? Some of the things that I've told you seems to have helped open up your ears. You're starting to hear a lot better. You feel like you kind of lost it. That's a normal thing. Don't worry. It's it could be part of the process. Um, you you just got to keep going. Just um, and again, as you said, right? Like finding your zen. Okay, so you can target it, but that doesn't mean you have to, you know, strain your ears and really like, you know, get the language into you, start feeling the patterns, feeling the stress through lots of exposure. Just keep your mind on, okay, I'm going to, you know, keep my ear open for stress, but I'm going to get lots of exposure to try to feel how that stress is working, how that stress is flowing. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's the point that you're at. You kind of just have to do that. Um, okay, Alan, sorry, it took me a second here. So we have these two symbols, um, these two vowels in no cut, cut merger are used in words like dog, saw, la, what is the difference? Okay, you say in no cut, cut merger, um, these two symbols are the cut, cut merger. So I'm not sure why the no is there. Um, So here's the thing. So maybe we have some confusion here. So these symbols, um, if you don't have the cot cot merger, you have these two sounds. If you do have the cot cot merger, you don't have those two sounds. Okay. You'll have this sound. And I know there's like an A going this way and an A going this way. I always confuse which one it is because I don't care. It doesn't matter. Um, the That's not what we're talking about. Symbols will never be the sounds that they represent. So at the end of the day, I, I don't care. Um, regardless of whether it's this way or this way, the point is, is that between these two that we're talking about between ah and ah, okay. Um, if you don't have the merger, you have ah, which is used in some words like hot. And if you, if you, ha uh, and then you have ah, which is used in some words like um, probably saw, I don't know. Um, I don't know all the words where it's used because I have the merger. If you do have the merger, the symbol that's used for the the sound like in hot, we keep the symbol, right? The, in IPA, apparently they decided to keep that symbol, shift it backwards because that's where aw is, but aw is higher. So aw disappeared, but it sort of pulled ah back here uses the same symbol, and that's what the merger is. This sound disappeared, this sound disappeared. The symbol is you this symbol is used back here instead. And now we just have one sound. So hopefully that that clears up any confusion. Um, so me, because I have the cot cot merger, I say dog, saw, la, they're all pronounced exactly the same. There, there's no time that I choose to say ah or I choose to say all. Okay. It's always just ah. Now, that being said, you will notice if you pay close attention, people who have the merger, like myself, uh, we will subconsciously sometimes, when it's supposed to be the unmerged version, either ah or all, sometimes you'll, no you'll hear us do the unmerged version. I've noticed that when listening back to my videos when I'm editing. Um, but that's like an artifact from before the merger. Um, and we don't realize we're doing it. Uh, we usually don't hear it at all. Uh, so it's something that you don't have to pay attention to. You don't have to care about. Point is, if you are going to learn the cot cot merger, which I strongly recommend, you don't have to, but I strongly recommend it because it makes your life a lot easier. Um, say all of the words that would use ah, if you go to the dictionary and you see the symbol for ah, or you see the symbol for all, just know that you can just pronounce it with ah. It's just one sound. Bam. A whole bunch of words just became a lot easier. Um, okay. Uh, moving on. Wendell is here. Wendell, Wendell. Um, with all the questions as usual. I see Jonathan is here as well. Hello, Jonathan. Finn is here. Welcome, Finn. Okay. So we're working our way through here. <sighs> Time to get to the, the wall of Wendell. <laughs> So I'm going to call it the wall of Wendell. It's just a wall of questions. Not that it's bad. Um, it's good. Always love the questions. So I have five questions today. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Numbered, very orderly. I like it. Uh, I think any question would 
open more possibility to us? Yes, of course. Yeah, all questions are welcome. All questions are good. Um, we have to think about your recent. Might be a typo. Recent, R-E-C-E-N-T. There's no I in there. Uh, recent offers. I'm trying to arrange some problems with my debit card, but I'll fix it. See things in advance. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, you might be referring either to the channel memberships or most likely my classes, um, which I'll make a quick announcement about. Yes. Uh, right now, I haven't changed the prices yet. I'm if I remember to do it right after the live stream, I'm going to. But um, I made a community post yesterday saying that I'm going to be bringing my class prices down uh, for financial reasons because I know. A lot of you guys are hurting financially. I'm hurting financially. Yes, here, even in the United States, many of us are being affected. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not like, you know, some of those other teachers that, you know, are, um, they just have, you know, so much money, you know, like things are, are a little tough right now <laughs> uh, where I'm at, especially since I'm in California and gas is like six dollars a gallon which is insane some places it's a lot higher than that in california um because one of my jobs right now uh i'm doing uh, some of you already know this and uh, as a side job to try to make some more money i do um doordash food delivery thing um and i'm currently i don't even do that all day i just i do it very part-time in the evening and I'm spending like four to five hundred dollars on gas every month, just on gas, four to five hundred dollars. So it's almost not worth doing the job anymore <laughs> because it's really eating into the, the money that I make from the job. So things are getting kind of tough. So for financial reasons, for me and for you guys, um, I am going to be lowering my class fees. Uh, consultation is going to lower to $35 an hour. The uh, pronunciation mouth posture course, it's still a mouth posture course. It's not uh, something else. But the mouth posture pronunciation training course is also going to drop down to $35. I know it's still kind of a lot, but I can't go too low. Uh, hopefully, that'll help both of us out um, for those of you who can afford it at that price. But anyway, moving on. Um, okay, Wendell, number one, do you got potatoes <laughs> versus do you have potatoes is the first sentence correct. Very good question. Yeah, so uh, got is a common replacement for have, but got is also a common replacement for a lot of words. <laughs> um, one of the things that you have to be careful of uh, when using got to replace have is that it can sound very informal it can sound very informal. In this particular case, it sounds very informal. Very, very informal. Um, if you say, instead of like saying, um, I think an example that would actually not be a change in meaning. Uh, so if you say, I have to go, instead of that, you say, I got to go, I got to go. That does not sound necessarily informal. That's a very standard, normal expression. Uh, maybe in like a very formal situation, you wouldn't use that. Uh, but it it's kind of like wanna. Wanna isn't necessarily informal. It's a normal part of speech. Um, given the situation, maybe it can sound kind of informal, but it's normal. Um, so if you say, I got to go, meaning I have to leave or I have to go, right? I got to leave. No problem. Uh, but in a case like this, it does sound more informal. So the first sentence is correct, technically, depending on who you ask. Many teachers would probably say it's wrong. Um, but that's why it sounds informal. It is, whether it's technically wrong or not, it is correct. It just sounds very informal. Okay. A hundred years from now, it'll probably not sound informal anymore. But for now, it does. Uh, number two, potatoes or tubers? Yes, they are. Um, with generic and plural nouns, the article the is not used. If I use the word potato in singular, uh, in, if I say in the singular, I think that would be better. Um, can I admit the article the, the same with mangoes versus mango? It's so weird. I usually say mango. Sometimes I say mango, like I just did. Uh, what about the word baseball? Can I use it sometimes the article? That? Okay, so this is a more complicated question. Potatoes are tubers. 
Critical does not used. If I use the word potato in singular. Okay, so so you're saying so we don't say the potatoes are tubers. Um, technically, that is grammatically correct if you say the potatoes are tubers. Um, <laughs> but it, it kind of doesn't work and it becomes it, it's kind of meaningless here like there's no reason to say the because if you say the it sounds like you're talking about these potatoes are tubers compared to some other potatoes but all potatoes are tubers right so the just becomes it, it there's no reason to use it right um it would still sound grammatically correct it just wouldn't quite make much sense because there's no purpose for it um if you say the potato is a tuber, which seems to be what your question is about, if you use it in the singular, the potato is a tuber. Um, here, right? So one use of like the something, instead of saying like let's let's say this is a potato, right? And I'm talking about the potato, right? So I introduce it a potato. This is a potato. Okay, now I'm talking about the potato. So the potato is large. Okay. Um, that is talking about a specific example of, of the potato that I've introduced and now I'm referring to as the potato. That's one use of the. the one of the things that you have to understand about articles is that right the, the general rule that you learn, which is a good guideline, it is a good guideline. A is for something specific, D is for something general. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the rule that they teach you, right? Okay. And that will Wait, is that true? Maybe it's the other way around. I forget. See, it's confusing in my mind because whatever the rule is, the opposite can also work. Um, right? So, yeah, if I say a potato, I'm talking about one specific potato. Um, I can then use the potato to refer to that specific potato, right? So, um, yeah, I forgot what the rule is. This is confusing. I feel like I'm, I know what I'm talking about, but it doesn't sound right at the same time. <laughs> I really hate articles just as much as you guys do. I'm going to figure that out later. Um, there's seven pages of rules, okay? It's it's tricky. I just use them. But anyway, the, back to the point here. When we say the potatoes, okay, or not the potatoes, the potato is a tuber. Um, that is a grammatically correct use of the. Now I'm not, I'm not referring to a specific potato that I introduced with A and then I'm now saying the potato. Um, I'm talking about the potato as, as an item, basically. It's like, you know, there are potatoes and then there are, I don't know, bananas, right? Um, so when we say the potato, we're kind of referring to it as, as an item within a category, I guess. Um, so it is kind of specific in a way because we're saying it's, it's the item, you know, under, say, fruits and vegetables, there's the potato. Not as a specific instance of a potato, but talking about potatoes in general um, as like a species, right? So a species of, of, of plant or species of uh, vegetable. So if you say the potato is a tuber, you're still talking about all potatoes. You're not talking about a specific potato. Um, even though you're using the singular and you're using the, that statement is talking about all potatoes. Okay, but it's talking about all potatoes in a very general way. Um, and it, it's it's a weird thing that we do in English. It's a weird thing that we do in English. Don't worry, eventually I'm going to sort all that out. And it'll, it'll, it'll make more sense when I eventually get to, to the articles. Um, that's going to be a big headache for me at some point in the future, but I will I will figure it out for you guys. Don't worry. <laughs> um, it, it may break the limits of my how my brain works, but I'm going to try. Um, So I, I assume that's what you're asking, because if I try to say, like if you say potato is a tuber, that just doesn't sound right. Okay. Um, you can say a potato is a tuber. You can also use a. Um, that also works as well. And actually, whether you say the potato is a tuber or a potato is a tuber, technically there's a small difference and it feels slightly different, but the 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 meaning that results is actually the same. This is actually a good case where the and a um, and I'm, I'm thinking without a specific context, because um, maybe in a sp specific context, there would be a more meaningful difference. But this is probably a good general example of how the and A can actually be used in the same place and mean pretty much the same thing. That happens sometimes. Um, so that's part of the problem of why it's all mixed up and, and whatever. Um, 
hopefully that answers your question. That's what I understood by your question. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, uh, what about the words baseball? Can I use sometimes with the article the? Okay, what this question is asking is, can you use the word sometimes with the article the? So can I sometimes use base the word baseball with the article the? That would be a more accurate sentence to what you're trying to say. Um, what you said is grammatically correct. It's just saying something slightly different. <laughs> um, although technically, I suppose we have a broken clause between baseball and can in that case. Anyway, it just it sounds weird. Okay. Uh, so saying the baseball, okay. If you're talking about the sport, no, baseball is a sport, baseball, basketball, football, soccer, right. Or non-American football, <laughs> non United States football. Uh, but, uh, if you're talking about, right. So again, my, my phone is, you know, it's, it's a ditto, you know, Pokemon, it can just turn into a bunch of things if you use your imagination, right? Imagination. So <laughs> instead of a potato, let's imagine that this is a baseball, right? The, the actual ball that they use in the sport, baseball. Then you can use the article the, okay? We're talking about the baseball, a baseball, the baseball that I'm now referring to. Um, you can say the baseball players, but that's not the baseball, that's the players, and you're using baseball to describe what kind of players. So it's actually being used as an adjective instead of a noun. Um, so you, there are times, don't confuse, just because you see the and baseball next to each other doesn't mean it's the baseball, right? Um, but the words might be next to each other in the sentence. Uh, so for what you're asking, or what I'm pretty sure you're asking and talking about the sport itself. No, I don't think you can ever use the, um, maybe there's a case that I can't think of one. Uh, but if we're talking about the item, a baseball itself, yes. If you're talking about the baseball players, technically it's, it's before baseball in the sentence, but it's not attached. Uh, for example, who created the baseball or who created baseball? Yeah. So if we're talking about the sport, who created baseball, if you say the, it, it immediately makes it sound the only way that that makes sense in the way that our brains are going to interpret it either a it's just going to sound weird to us or b because you put the there we're going to think that you're talking about a physical baseball like who created this specific baseball um which is kind of weird but i mean somebody could make you know maybe you have a baseball making competition you say who created this baseball right um so obviously that'd be a, probably a little weird, a little weird, <laughs> um, but that's that's where our where our brains would want to go for interpreting that. Um, if you're talking about the sport, who created baseball? That's it. Um, now you could say who created the sport baseball. Now it's the sport; they're actually together. That does work because we're talking about a specific sport. But when we're talking about the instances of sports. Um, like baseball, basketball, football, we don't say the. Um, and I know that's kind of confusing because it's like, well, it's, you know, it should be the, you know, this particular sport, this particular sport, this, so we should say the baseball, the basketball. It doesn't work that way. Um, and if it helps, think of it as the is already attached to sport. And so we don't attach it to the specific name of the sport, right? And the, the sport is implied. Right. So who created baseball? Who created the sport baseball? It's implied there in the background. Um, OK, uh, three. Can I say find anyone in the match to challenge someone who's challenging me <laughs> and is not even in the match? What <laughs> or find anyone to challenge me? OK, find anyone in the match to challenge someone who's challenging me and is not even in the match. Okay, so you're having a match with somebody, you're playing a game, and you want to, somebody who is not in the match against you right now, some other person challenges you. And you're challenging them back. That's, that's what I understand from this. <laughs> I don't think the way you describe that is exactly what you're trying to ask because that's kind of weird. Doesn't make, I mean, it makes sense, but it, it doesn't match what you're asking. Um, if you say find anyone to challenge me, that just means you're looking for somebody to challenge you. 
right? So if you say, I can't find anyone to challenge me, nobody wants to challenge me. Okay. Um, if you say find anyone in the match, that's a completely different sentence that has nothing to do with, with the second sentence. Um, anyone in the match would be somebody who is who is already in the challenge. They're already in the game, right? So there's like, there's, say I'm playing baseball, there's me and my teammates, you and your teammates on the other side. These are the people in the match, in the game, right? Um, completely different sentence. So, yeah. Uh, do a test, give a test, take a test are synonymous or give a test refers only to the teacher. So the, the most common collocation group of words there would be um, for a student would be to take a test. Yes. Um, give a test would be from the teacher. A student doesn't give a test. Um, now you could, maybe you finish your test and you give the test to the teacher. You're literally handing it to them. I mean, that could work, but <laughs> that's obviously not what we're talking about here. Um, do a test uh also works there's a little bit of a line depending on what kind of test we're talking about sometimes do doesn't uh do might not work but um because you can like you can take an academic test right you go to class your teacher gives you a test you have to do the test right do the test um or take the test they were just fine there as synonyms um if you are uh doing a blood test right you have to go to the doctor and they're going to test your blood um, you don't take a blood test. Well, I guess you could. I have to take a blood test. Yeah, okay, it does. <sighs> when I wasn't thinking of a context, it sounded weird. It might be more context specific. Um, I have to do a blood test. I have to take a blood test. Yeah, the, the, it's, it still works there. It feels to me like there's a little bit of a difference. Maybe not. Anyway, um, Obviously, there's something weird going on in the mind here. <laughs> uh, but generally, do a test and take a test will, will be synonymous. Give a test is um, from a teacher's perspective. Now, if you go, say you're going to give a blood test, the person who who takes your blood, they're not giving you a blood test. It doesn't apply in that case, right? Um, they're, uh, you could say they're administering a blood test, maybe. It sounds a little more uh, fancy, a little more formal. Um, but I have to give a blood test. Maybe in that profession, they do use that and I'm just not exposed to it. And so it, it seems weird to me. Um, but I, I, I don't, I've never heard that uh, in that context. So, uh, but either way, again, that would be from the, the perspective of the person providing the test, not the person doing or taking the test. Um, okay. Number five, is there any difference between those, these? Okay, if you say those, that refers back to something you already said or something I already said, uh, either way. Here, you're saying two sentences and then giving the sentences, so it has to be these two sentences, meaning the two sentences that I'm about to, to say. So is there any difference between these two sentences? Um, I saw a white small bus versus I saw a small white bus. Good question. So this has to do with adjective word order. Um, English has a very stupid and somewhat strict adjective order, depending on if like, so there's like size, shape, color, et cetera, et cetera. And like, this one has to go before this one and this one has to go after that one and if you have all three they have to be in this order if you you know say you don't have this one then it would just be this one to that one because it's still the same order uh you just don't have this middle one um so there there is sort of a, a, a more or less an order of adjectives that english likes to use otherwise it'll sound weird and i really hate that because <laughs> it's a very unnecessary complication for you guys but it is how the language is um, if you don't use the right order it's going to sound very strange to a native it's not going to feel good to us it's going to feel weird um, if you say i saw a white small bus my body in my body not just to my ears but in my body i can feel it like here in my chest and my gut it feels wrong 
it, it, I don't, I don't like how it feels. Okay. I saw a white small bus. If, if, but if you say I saw a small white bus, a small white bus flows perfectly. Like, like, uh, I don't know, just a flowing river, free flowing. It's beautiful. Okay. Um, I'm going to have a solution to that at some point. I already have an idea for it. Um, but that's going to come in the future. There's so much not related to pronunciation that's coming in the future. <laughs> but I can only do so much at once. Um, once the channel reaches a, a, a point that it's like, like I'm going to be completely honest with you guys right now. Two months ago, my ad revenue got up got up to finally it was like the first time ever two months ago it reached fifty dollars in a 30-day period now youtube only pays me if it reaches a hundred dollars so if it's 50 it'll roll over until i eventually hit 100. um so fifty dollars since i monetized my channel fifty dollars is the most i've ever made in a single month from from the from ads and that, that also includes like channel memberships and stuff but i don't really have a lot of those right now so kind of doesn't do much. Um, I'd very much appreciate it. You know, become a channel member, support the channel if you can, but uh, that's not a, a big factor right now. So it's mostly ads. Right now, because of the economic situation, it's actually dropped down. Um, it was down to like 34. It's kind of come back up to about 38, which is nice. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not even making $40 a month right now on, on from YouTube. Once the channel reaches a certain point that I can start covering, as I've said before, as a, when I can cover an editor, because I can't pay for that in my own pocket. <laughs> um, it's way too expensive. Um, uh, and uh, preferably also an assistant to help me with like some social media, making the podcast version, this and that, that I do not have the time and energy for. Um, once the channel, the channel is making enough money to pay for that type of stuff, um, things are going to get a lot better. Things are going to get uh, probably more consistent. Um, there's going to be a lot more content. I want to have, you know, like say on like Mondays, I do this, uh, like, you know, say like, I don't know, every week I do a particular thing on Monday. I do a particular thing on Wednesday, whatever, have like, you know, four or five videos a week. Um, I want to get to that point, but I can't do that by myself. Um, like maybe if this was all I was doing and I killed myself doing it, I could maybe do that, but I have classes. As I said, I have my second job, like <laughs> I just don't have the time um, or the energy. So uh, as the channel grows, eventually we'll, you know, it'll reach a snowball effect. But right now it's still very slow. I'm still trying to do everything myself. Um, and so all the content that I've mentioned before, like more preposition lessons, um, talking about other areas of grammar, the articles, um, things like this with adjective order. I have plans to get to all of that stuff, but I can only do so much at once. Right now I'm working on the intonation series and that is a big enough headache as it is. <laughs> so be patient, but um, if you want to support the channel, um, best thing you can do to support the channel is just watch lots of content because the ad revenue. But um, if you can directly support by clicking the join button under the video, that would also really help a lot. Um, I know not everybody can do that or wants to do that, and that's fine. It's optional. But um, it's a nice little plug here <laughs> um, to uh, you know, support English hacks if you can and want to. Okay, moving on. Uh, I heard a guy go, I don't know that's supposed to be id or id, uh, to say I don't have enough damage. Okay, that's going to be I. I had enough damage. And I completely understood what he said without thinking twice about it. I really hadn't noticed it. I would very, very much imagine that this was rooted in a context. Because if, if it's supposed to be I don't have enough damage... I can already imagine it's probably like like maybe a Dungeons and Dragons type of situation where you're, you're playing some sort of game. Um, so I, I can pick up that much. Uh, but if somebody just said, I had enough damage, I had enough damage, what I would interpret that as is not I don't have enough damage. 
I would interpret that as um, I had enough damage. So it'd actually be past tense, positive, not present tense, negative. So I think that there's more in the context that allowed you to understand that if that's what he said. Uh, because the sounds by themselves do not mean <laughs> what you're saying that they mean. Um, interesting. Uh, can you say alternatively as alternatively? Alternatively. Alternatively, yes. Maybe. It's kind of pushing the limits, um, especially if you're speaking really fast, it's probably not going to stand out. Um, if you're in normal speed speech, or alternatively, we could do this. Alternatively, we could do this. It works. It works. Um, again, it's kind of on the edge, but it, it, it works. Um, if you're going too slow, it's not going to work. It's, it's going to stand out. If you say alternatively, no, 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 no. So uh, I've heard people getting rid of the first vowel in especially, <laughs> pronouncing it like especially. Yeah, it only happens at the beginning of utterances, though. Yeah, that's a very common thing. Um, and obviously, especially is a different word, but based on the context and, and everything, uh, it's it's going to be very clear what it is. Um, so yeah, that's not really a problem. Um, and that that's not informal or anything. It's just a normal reduction of dropping the first sound. It's fine. Um, in vocalic L at the end of a word. Ugh. Okay, <laughs> vocalic L uh, is a Vowel sound only or weak L2. I have no idea what your question is. I know we're talking about L's. Vocalic L, I imagine, is the dark L, what I call the half L vowel sound, because it does work as a vowel. Um, when you say, is a vowel sound only or weak L2, and then you say weak L, I would imagine weak L would also refer to the dark L. So I'm, I'm kind of confused what... In your definition, what is a vocalic L and what is a weak L? Um, and this is one reason why I, I tell you guys to avoid a lot of these terms. Uh, I mean, if you're interested in it and you want to learn of it, fine. But um, it, like, I'm a teacher and it's confusing me. <laughs> um, There's a reason why I, I label things the way that I do to, to make them clearer and simpler. So reiterate what you mean there. What is a vocalic L? Can you give me an example of a word with that? And then what is a weak L? Um, but uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that if, uh, after you clarify. Um, I see we got some new people in here. John, welcome. Joe, welcome. Hola, profe. Hola, que tal? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get down to you uh, in a second, John. I'm trying to go in order here. Um, so just bear with me. Don't want to skip over anybody. Um, okay. Even if the colors don't appeal to you as much as they do to me, or as they do me, that sounds okay, right? Uh, when I first heard, I feel like there should be a two <laughs> between do and me because it's an indirect object. Okay, yeah. So even if the colors don't appeal to you as much as they do me. This is perfectly fine, yes. The two is optional um, in this particular case. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, this is this is coming from, it, it's part of a, a bigger sentence uh, or, or in response to something. Um, because the, the sentence itself kind of feels incomplete. Uh, but yes, yes, uh, you, you can drop the two. Um, so good, so your, your instincts are right there, right? Because we, we um, that tells me that, that you've, you've received a sufficient level of exposure to feel what's supposed to be there. 
Right. Now you you mentioned indirect object, and that's a bit of a grammar term. Maybe you you uh, you probably have a bit of studying there too, and maybe your uh, your grammar analysis bells went off when you heard someone say that. Um, But I would like to think, since you're quite advanced, that you you can actually feel this. It's not just like you have that knowledge, but like, hey, shouldn't there be a two here? Um, but it is possible to drop it in this case. Yes, that's fine. So um, that probably happens a little less frequently, um, which is part of the reason why you would expect it to be there. But it, it's perfectly fine. Uh, is the R colored? Eh, the exact same as the regular eh. I know it can start further back, but I mean just in vowel quality. I feel like with the R colored eh, my tongue's wider maybe, or maybe a bit raised. <laughs> I was like, what's the plus for? <laughs> That's an interesting way to link your uh, <laughs> your comments there with the character limit running out. Um, maybe a bit raised in the back. Eh, eh. I'm trying to I'm trying to do air naturally but still isolate what is happening with the start of it which is a little hard to do bed let's see bed yeah bed 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 air 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 bear 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 As far as I can tell, because I've, I've done some analysis on it before, but um, going back over it, as far as I can tell, the start position itself, right, where before you initiate the sound, because since it's R colored, as soon as you start the sound, it's already in motion. Right. But there's that start position that like, OK, if we go here be, before we even start saying the sound, what is that position? As far as I can feel in my mouth and I can tell. It's either exactly the same as just a plain eh, or. Um, it's going to be like 99, 98 percent exactly the same. If there's any differences, they're very, very minute. Um, the, the problem with, with diphthongs, uh, which our colored vowels are, are technically under that category, um, is as I said, you immediately start moving into the end position. Um, it's not eh, er, right? Or even eh, er, right? There's no point where the eh gets held out. It immediately starts getting blended. So it can be really hard, even for me, to kind of go in and figure out, okay, is there something going on here? Uh, or is there not? And I would say, I would say no. Um, they're they're going to be the same. Yeah. But again, that's your starting position. So as soon as you're starting the sound, there's going to be some sort of shift. And whatever your tongue does for that as it transitions into the er, that's a different question. <laughs> um, but the start of the eh in both cases would be exactly the same. Yeah. There, there's there's no difference. Um, okay, John, what type of hack are you going to use? So are you, if you don't use R, it sounds more informal, but just, just so you know, in case, <laughs> since we are English learners here, what type of hack uh, are you going to use to explain a slang term mixing bowl of wordplay? What? I was talking to a U.S who had no idea that we have very colorful language. What? <laughs> I don't understand your question. Mixing bowl of wordplay doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I was talking to a American who had no idea that we have very colorful language. Uh, yeah, can you clarify? 
maybe the the this the term is mixing bowl of wordplay is that the, the actual slang term is in which case you should put quotations around it um Okay, Urban Dictionary Mixing Bowl. Ah, I see. Might be a little bit of trolling going on here. I was kind of wondering if this is what it was about. Um, Okay. Well, congratulations. Uh, I I always like to give people the benefit of the doubt and not assume they're trolls. Uh, and maybe John has done just such a good job uh, at initially hiding his trollingness quality. Um, but it could also be a legitimate question. Either way, uh, this person has successfully gotten me to say something that is apparently in the Urban Dictionary. I don't recommend you look it up, but that's up to you. Uh, something that is not family friendly, because it was a slang term that I had no idea <laughs> about. Um, so I am going to, unfortunately, sorry, John. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and remove you. I won't report you, but I will remove you. Um, and I'm just going to move on. Uh, okay, Alan Miranda. Uh, Miranda. Some natives with no cut cut merger. Sorry. Pronounce saw la and pucker lips, but other less pucker. I mean... Real O sound, no front, central, or back. Uh -huh. I don't think pucker is the word you're looking for. Pucker is this. Okay, that would be pucker. Like when you're, you're uh, doing like an extreme kissing or like a kissy face right that's pucker so it's not quite what you're looking for yeah you are definitely a troll oh my god do not spam i am reporting you don't look at that guys don't look at that that's not family friendly content definitely not family friendly content oh my god i'm gonna need a helper i'm trying to report this guy as much as i as quickly as i can Report. Can I ban you? Do I have an option to like ban you? Hide user on this channel, user timeout. Uh, hide user on this channel, let's do that. User messages will be hidden, perfect. Okay, let me report that one again. Well, as unfortunate as it is, um, It's also a good sign, right? I'm getting attention. We're growing. We're growing. <laughs> growing pains of, of being on a of being being a YouTuber, right? You have to deal with spam and trolls, and so. Okay. Anyway, so that's not not quite pucker. Um, I think what you're talking about is um, so like people who do have the cock merger, right? When they do the that backward C symbol, like all all kind of like that, the lips kind of come out. Okay. Um, I don't know if this will exactly answer your question. Um, cause you also say, yeah, so you're talking about people who don't have the cock cock merger, right? Um, what you're probably noticing is range. Okay. Every sound in, in the language, especially vowel sounds, especially vowel sounds, um, the, the stop consonants, because you have to, you know, close and push out here, 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 wherever. Um, there's a little bit less of a range for those. Uh, there's still a bit of a range, but uh, for 
other consonants like the S sound, the TH sound, et cetera, et cetera, um, or especially for vowel sounds, uh, all sounds have a range. And what I mean by a range is uh, you can think of there being, I've talked about this before, there's a fully enunciated version and there's, right, as you speak faster and or more lazily, uh, which they tend to go together faster and lazy, but they're not exactly the same, um, you get farther and farther away from that clear, perfect enunciated sound until logically the sound disappears. Now you can't just make any sound disappear, obviously, but that would be the logical other end. Um, so there are cases where say like a T at the end of a word might disappear. Um, that would be where right, there's like a strong T, a weak T, um, a stop T, which is still there. It's being stopped, there's something there. And then no T where it completely drops. So that would be the scale uh, or the range. Um, this also affects what happens with the lips, okay? And um, this is actually good. Be, uh, is really, I'm glad you actually brought this up. Um, so let's talk about E really quick. I love talking about E because um, I hate the way teachers teach us. Um, most teachers, right, they're talking about the E sound. They say, okay, how do we make the E sound? Okay, well, you gotta give big smile, E. Yeah, uh, maybe if you are very clearly enunciating the sound or you are exaggerating the sound, uh, definitely, definitely, yeah. Um, the reason why we do that, right, American English needs a lot, a lot of space. Um, I, this is part of the reason why I think it happens in American English specifically, but um, we need a lot of space in the mouth. It's part of our mouth posture. When we're doing E, right, which, by the way, the jaw is not more closed, maybe a little bit more closed, but the jaw does not go from here to here when you're doing E. If you're doing it that way, you're not giving enough space, you're going to sound stifled, right? If I do E, 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 it doesn't sound like there's enough space in my mouth, okay? Um, so the jaw won't really close very much at all. The sound is high in the mouth. The tongue comes up. We're placing it here, right? Um, this is the teeth, top of the mouth. Uh, and that's all fine. But what's the range of the E sound? Okay. So there's, if the jaw doesn't really move very much, okay, that, that's, we don't have to worry too much about that. But then there's also the lips and there's the tongue. So what are the lips doing? Okay. Um, the lips, if you fully, super clearly enunciate the sound and or exaggerate the sound, um, then we're going to give that nice big smile. Okay. E, 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 E. And that's going to create, even though, um, right, because this is blocking a lot of the space in the front that we would have. We still do have some space back here. But by giving that nice big smile, it gives a little bit more space this way for the sound to come out. And it sounds clearer. It sounds more enunciated right? But listen to this, right? I could say E, 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 E. It's exactly the same sound. There's no significant difference uh, between it, be between the two. Um, so using your lips at all is not required to make the E sound. It's not a core part of the sound. Now we do very naturally tend to open up a little bit for E for the reasons I mentioned, right? Um, but that creates a range for the lips for the E sound. So if we're talking about the, the range of the E sound specifically as it regards the lips, fully enunciated, E, okay? Very lazy, which the tongue also probably isn't gonna be fully into position, it's gonna be um, a little bit on the track of transition from the center of gravity uh, into E. It sort of isn't fully into E uh, into E anymore. So instead of E, we get like E, 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 E. It's still an E sound. It's just very lazy. It's not all the way fully formed. We would still recognize it as an E. It's perfectly fine. It's still in the range of the sound for the tongue. Um, but for the lips specifically, if you're, if you're doing the sound really, really lazily, really quickly, whether it's stressed or not, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, the, the lips don't have to engage at all, okay? You don't have to use them at all. Um, what we tend to do is be somewhere in the middle more often than not, um, especially in the speed of, uh, like the flow of normal speed speech. You'll tend to see a little bit of that lip pulling, right? Um, but you will very rarely see E. Like I don't, I don't, uh, let me see if I can do this. Okay, let me see if I can do this. So 
every time that I say the E sound, I'm going to try to <laughs> make sure that I fully pull my lips to the sides, trying to notice where the E's are <laughs> in the flow in, in all the words. But you'll notice, right? Like you're not going to see the lips constantly pull, 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 pull every time there's an E sound. Okay. There's a range to the sound. Um, and we don't tend to use the fully clearly enunciated version of any sound. We, that, that's usually used for enunciating uh, or for exaggerating. Okay. It can technically happen at any time. Uh, but it's, it's not the, the rule. It's not the default. It's more the exception. It's, it's the, this end of the range that we don't usually go into. Okay. Um, so going back to people who don't have the merger and they have this lip thing going on with all, okay. There's a full version of the lips or maybe they come out even more. Oh, I saw, saw maybe something like that. I don't know how they do it. Cause I don't have the merger or I, I do have the merger. Um, Uh, but if they're speaking a little more quickly, a little more lazily, they just don't put the lips fully into that position. Same thing with ooh. Ooh, you, ooh, ooh. That's very exaggerated, very clear, very full. You, you, you. It's part of the same range. Or you, 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 you. Very lazy, very short, very quick. Okay. It's all part of the same thing, but it's, it's a range. Okay. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I'm pretty sure that's kind of what we're dealing with there. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, by the way, I also wanted to ask uh, what I should do when I find the perfect American schwa. Let's say I can pronounce it. What do I do next to build the center of gravity? Well, the uh, the schwa as I define it, right? Not that technical linguistic term, uh, which is the reduced version of the sound um, in American English, but the uh, 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 not uh, not ah, uh, like the upside down V, uh, 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 it's it's sort of it's it's in between, right? It's sort of like a a nice open clear schwa sound. Basically, again, it's, it's the range of one sound. That's the reality of it. Um, so when you're right there, that is the center of gravity. That is the center of gravity. Okay. Uh, uh, once you get your jaw in place, okay. Depending on if you had to, some, some languages, I, apparently in Brazilian Portuguese, you don't, you already hold your jaw open more or less open enough. Maybe you need to open a little bit more based on the work I've done with a Portuguese speaker. Uh, German speakers, based off the work I've done with, with an Austrian German speaker, um, the mouth is about as open as American English. But many languages that I've worked with, um, the jaw is more closed. So you have to get that in place first. If your language is already more or less open as much as American English is for the jaw, um, doesn't mean your tongue is the same, but the jaw might be the same. You don't have to worry about that too much. Um, but that's part of that perfect uh, sound. Okay. Cause if I don't have my mouth open enough, say I'm, I'm more about here and I say, uh, 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 see, I'm trying to do that center of gravity. I'm trying to do that nice full, uh, sound, but because my mouth is too close, I don't have enough space and it destroys the quality of the American sound. Okay. This is why the jaw opening is so important. Um, then in, addi in addition, there's, if your tongue is pushed forward or not, which is a different problem. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so when you build the center of gravity, that's why I say it's jaw and schwa, jaw and schwa, because you need to get the jaw open enough first, and then from there you build that uh sound into that jaw um, openness. Because remember, the jaw through the flow of speech, it doesn't move much. It looks like it moves because of this and because of this. It doesn't move much unless we're going into the clearly enunciated version of like ah or ah, then it might open more, but it generally stays around the same height. Um, So hopefully that's clear, right? The uh is the center of gravity in combination with the jaw openness. Um, what do you do after that? Well, that's the thing I haven't made the content on yet that I've been exploring with students. Um, 
which I'm really glad I didn't jump into trying to make another lesson for that because things have, I mean, the, the, the basic track, basic idea is the same, but um, the exact way that I'm probably going to end up presenting it has drastically changed. Um, what I'm currently recommending, which I can go ahead and tell you, uh, I got to stop watching that stuff. Um, wait, which stuff? I don't know what I was talking about. We do a little bit of trolling. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you guys can do trolling. That's fine. I don't care. But not people who are literally offensively trolling. That's not them. Um, okay. One thing that I would recommend for now uh, in lieu of the actual lesson that I haven't made yet. Um, see, because the, the thing I didn't anticipate is that the farther I try to get into building the mouth posture course, the harder it seems to be and the longer it seems to be taking, not because of the posture uh, or, or the course itself, but because number one, every single person that I start working with, they have to get through phase zero. Some people start phase zero and disappear because they don't see the value in it. They, they don't want to put the time in um, or whatever. Uh, some people get up to, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be slowly moving up, but I only see them like once every two weeks, you know, and I really don't think that's enough. I think they're going to have a lot of difficulty, but you know, that's what they can do. And so we're, we're trying and, and, and see, see what works. Um, uh, and then some of the people who are the most advanced that I've seen regularly, um, they haven't completely disappeared, but I haven't seen them uh, as frequently as I was seeing them, right? Maybe for financial reasons. And so it's kind of hard to get enough people up to the leading edge and then continue to push past that leading edge. Um, so that's, that's the problem I find myself in with developing this course. Uh, but what I have discovered so far that is going to be very useful, um, there's no longer going to be a full phase two where it's just about building all the vowels and consonants and then a phase three where it's about starting to build syllables and words um for various reasons one reason is that as i started um going deeper and deeper into building the sounds i realized that it started to actually become very impractical to try to get all the sounds first without building the syllables so um my current course. Um, there's two ways that I could do it. I'm probably going to choose the one that is maybe a little more engaging for people to help keep you guys on track. So that's what I'm going to mention here. Um, so there's the vowel E, 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 A. These are the four front vowels. Um, it is usually a bit of a headache for a lot of people. A is an absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Um, regardless of what we're doing. I'm not talking about for mouth posture. I'm just talking about like, this is one of the most single, most difficult sounds, if not the most difficult sound to get in American English um, and have it sound, you know, perfectly natural. Um, but there's those four front vowels. Um, what I'm thinking is probably going to be the best course of action is you work on making sure that you can produce each of those sounds. So you might have to find the I and the A if you don't have it yet. Um, and you only need about 80% perfect. So that it really helps to work with somebody. Um, if your ears are good enough to tell, then you can just use your own ears, record yourself, because that can help a little bit as well. But um, it's kind of tough doing it by yourself. I'm working with somebody, uh, one, of, one of my supporters, um, not an actual student right now. Uh, and he is actually successfully making it with instead of having my direct like class-based guidance, I'm kind of helping him, you know, on the side, giving him some tips, giving him some feedback. Um, but I'll, he's doing most of the work and his ears are pretty good. And so you can, you don't necessarily need somebody, but for the average person, you're probably going to need somebody to give you feedback. Uh, unfortunately. Anyway, the point is, is as long as you can get, whether from your own ears or from somebody else, you need some sort of good enough feedback to make sure that you're doing the sound well enough, um, to pass the 80% mark. Um, so there's the sounds themselves and there's the transition from a uh into the sound and back. Um, and this is very, very, very powerful for multiple reasons I've discovered. Um, and we're not going to go into all those details right now, but so let's, let's say E. E is a super easy uh, sound because many languages have E. They don't all sound exactly the same. And that is largely because of the mouth posture. Okay. Um, the difference in sound 
even with a different mouth posture, 4E is so very, very, very small. It does exist, but because it's so very small, it's not the biggest thing. It's not the end of the world. Um, uh, but it is still important to kind of get that transition and get that um, at least 90% of, of the sound because um, you're going to be flowing in and out of E to other sounds, right? So it still needs to kind of be built into the posture, even if the sound itself is already very similar in your language. Um, so it can't be completely ignored necessarily, uh, but say a sound like it or a ah, that you might have to actually find first, um, it's not as big of a deal as those. It's not going to give you as much trouble. Uh, but let's say, right, you get E. Okay. Um, now, part of getting the E is getting that center of gravity tension because it's always going to be there in some way. When I do E, um, I feel that there's a little bit of space here. The back can also be a little bit lower. Um, but we at least need central space. Now, obviously, the tongue is higher. The jaw isn't more closed, but the tongue is higher. Oh, my God, this guy again. <sighs> okay, hide. Support. Why you got to be, guy? Why you got to be? I mean, like, come on. Is it that hard to, like, not be a, a horrible person? It's really not that hard. Not that hard. Um... Okay, got that cleaned up again. So, um, like a fly just keeps buzzing around or something. Uh, anyway, so you get the E, you want to try to build the center of gravity into the sound. Okay, so so that's part of building the sound itself. Uh, finding the sound is most important, say for like it and at. You probably already have the sound for E, it's just not quite, you know, it doesn't have that posture built into it. Um, you might have a slightly different placement if you know if your tongue is pushed farther forward you know that's obviously something we want to undo and so the way that you normally do e in your language it's probably going to be maybe a little farther back um but it's going to be around the same area using a, around the same part of the tongue probably with a pretty similar shape but you want to get that center of gravity tension in there it's going to feel like there's a little bit of a dip a little bit of pressure here when you're doing e okay um, and we have this little bit of space here. So again, the mouth isn't, that's what I was saying, the mouth isn't uh, necessarily more closed. It can close up a little bit, that's fine. But the mouth, it's not that, that the jaw is more closed. Um, we still need a little bit of space there because the tongue is, is up here, the sound is here. Um, and then we have this sort of tension. It's almost like there's a squished ball pushing down here. Um, so that's for the sound itself, getting it with the posture. Um, then the transition, uh, which is kind of part, you can kind of use it as a supplement to trying to build the the posture into the sound and or finding the sound, but these are two different things. Um, the transitions are super, super important. They don't seem so at first, but they are. You want to go from a uh into e, e into a. Uh. And if you listen to, I don't want to say any native necessarily, but um, if you listen to more or less any native that uh, has a, a neutral sound and you, you tell them, like, if you just say, you go up to them and say, Hey, can you do, um, like start in the sound, uh, and then go to the sound E. And if you listen, I can, this is a very broad statement. I, I don't know. I'm not shooting myself in the foot here, but, <laughs> um, my, my idea and what should happen, I'm very certain that this should happen. Um, is that you're going to hear something that is almost exactly the same, which is going to be this. Uh... Okay. Now, if you hear what you what you don't want to do, you don't want to do something like this. Uh... E e that's that's not quite the right e sound okay so there could be something either where you end up in the wrong place or somewhere along that transition going from uh into e or backward e okay it should follow a pretty predictable path going into the sound and out of the sound okay roughly it doesn't have to be 100 percent pin perfect it's not an exact science um but yes fernando thank you <laughs> and welcome um but uh there's going to be a, a pretty solid path there that, that you can identify and, and build into your mouth. You want to, so you want to do that for e -a -a -a. find the sound, try to build the posture into the sound. Um, at least 80% doesn't have to be hundred percent. In fact, I'd recommend you don't get hundred percent right away. You can improve that over time, get to 80%. Um, 
because 100 percent, especially for it and a is it's, it's going to take you way too long it's going to derail you um, it's just going to slow you down get it to 80 percent um, make sure your transition from uh into each sound and back is at least 80 percent okay you can hold that center of gravity going in and out of the sound okay um, now for this stage that might not seem very important like why am i going from uh into e and e into uh like this seems boring and pointless and stupid but then if you start to realize oh if the center of gravity is always there if that central tension is always there in some way then it doesn't matter if i'm doing a consonant sound if i'm doing a vowel sound i'm going to have to flow from sound to sound to sound and hold that center of gravity posture and this is the first step of being able to do that because First, you're figuring out how to build it into E, into I, into E, into A. Then you're going to start doing uh, uh, G, N. And uh, once you master K, G, N, I also recommend T, D, N. There's a bit of variation of what you can do here. You can maybe put that to the side for a while, but this is what I'm doing right now with people. Um, so we have two consonant sets, right? We get sort of three sounds for one here and three sounds for one here because they use the same placement, uh, same position. Um, and you build the posture into those sounds, make sure those sounds are good, that they sound nice and clear, um, and that you can feel that tension as you go, say, releasing the K into uh, going from uh into the K, whatever it is. Same thing like you did with the basic vowels, okay? Again, that might seem kind of pointless, Right? Like, okay, well, why am I doing that? But then you realize, okay, if I need to go from K to E, right, which creates the word key, or if you need to go from K to E to E, which creates the word keep, remember, center of gravity is always there. The mouth posture is always there, which means, yes, in these words, in these syllables, these combination of sounds, you're no longer going from uh into a sound and then back into uh. But by going through that process, building that mouth posture into the sounds and practicing those transitions, now when you go from k to e, you have to make sure that center of gravity is still there, which is a lot harder to do if you didn't practice building it into e, building it into k, right? Because now you got to go from K to E with that central tension intact. Okay, so it starts to add up. It starts to make a lot more sense of why you're doing these transitions, not just trying to get the sounds, but actually literally anchoring them into that central posture. And then when you start going flowing from sound to sound to sound without the uh, um, you have that center of gravity more solidly built in and it starts getting easier and easier you get a snowball effect where every single sound that you build into the posture makes holding the posture easier right especially you have like the front vowels the back vowels you're attacking it from two different angles right or you have like consonants here consonants here you're attacking it from different angles so every single sound that you add and every single new transition between sounds that you add uh the mouth posture will become easier and easier and easier. And that's what my students who are on the leading edge um, are starting to realize that, hey, this actually is a snowball effect. Once you get the basics down, it starts very, very slow with phase zero. Because if you don't have control over, over your tongue, you can't feel what you're doing, you can't do this work. It's not possible. Okay, you, you basically just be wasting your time. But if you go through phase zero, you go through these seemingly pointless exercises of moving your throat around and moving the back of your tongue around by itself, you know, all that stuff, there's a purpose for it. Um, it's like trying to learn how to use your hands. If you never used your hand before, you don't want to go and try to pick something up because you don't have any control, right? You're going to try to pick it up and it's just going to fall. Okay. Learn how to use your fingers first, how to make them move in different ways, get better control over them. Okay. Now you can do whatever you want. You can pick this up, you can twirl it around, you can throw it up and catch it. Okay, it's what you're doing for your vocal tract. Um, <clears throat> then you build that center of gravity, John Schwa. And then from there, everything gets built from that center of gravity. And it just starts getting faster and easier as you go. Um, now, I haven't reached the end of it yet, so I, I there's still some variables I don't know you know, how long it would take the average person to go through. Um, 
I'm still trying to think of more techniques than just like getting the sound and using these transitions. Um, but this is where we are now. And you can start playing with that if you want. Um, and just make sure you're getting some sort of feedback. So, yeah. Um, the, the first two students that I got the farthest with, um, we did, this is the other path. Um, we did all of the basic vowels, the monothongs, uh, including O, since O can be a monothong. So it'd be E, 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 A, 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 obviously the center of gravity. Um, er, U, O, E, the like in book, and ul, the half L vowel sound, which is also a vowel, and that's part of it. Um, we went through all of those before I started adding the consonants. Because it was at that point, we were going to move on to the diphthongs. And that's when I kind of realized this is getting a little impractical. Um, and there's, we can start getting some benefits by starting to build some syllables here and some basic words. Um, and so I shifted and I started bringing in the, the kaga ng, um, which I very strongly think at the moment, maybe I'll change my mind. I very strongly think that's the best consonant group to, to add in first for various reasons. Tada n is the best second consonant group to add in for various reasons. Um, and you can guess pub m is going to be next. Uh, so if you want, there is value to this, but there's there's trade offs. Um, instead of going e a a or e e a a, try to do a and a at the same time. Um, instead of do, doing those four and then moving into uh, those consonant clusters and starting to combine them, uh, you can build all of the basic vowels and then add the consonant clusters. Um, and I don't want to linger too much on this point, but there's there's benefits one way and, and drawbacks as well as benefits and drawbacks the other way. So um, I think for the average person, it's probably best to do the first four front vowels. Um, and uh, maybe also add an ah as a, as a fifth vowel. It's in the back, but it's relatively easy. Um, it gives you a, a nice extra common sound to use. Um, so the first four or five vowels uh, on the vowel chart, and then start adding in some consonants, start playing with some syllables and some words. Again, always trying to don't rush, go very, very slow. When you do your transitions, you should try to do them very slowly. Uh, e. Okay. Slow. Slow is fast, fast is slow. Trust me. You're gonna want to do that. It's 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 like steroids for, for your skill development. Okay. Slow is one of the best techniques that you can use to learn faster and better. Um, and put a dot on it, right? Notice I went, uh, I got to E, and then I said E. I pushed out because even for me, like if I go into E or E, um, if I don't put a dot on it, it might feel like it's far enough. But then I put the dot on it, and I might, instead of going like E, like E, 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 sounds kind of like a lazy E, right? Um, so I feel like, okay, maybe I'll go f farther forward. Uh, eh, eh. Okay, now that sounds, sounds better. Um, so always put a dot on it to, to make sure that the point where you're at is the right sound. And then start from there, go back into uh, and then when you're done there, put a dot on it and you know stop and say uh. Okay, so always make sure you're in the right, right ending position. Uh, also... Um, for each sound, especially the vowel sounds and especially the front vowel sounds. Remember, there's a fully enunciated version and there's a lazy version. Um, the lazy version is just not fully done, right? So there's ways that the lips can get involved, especially for E. Um, for A, right, the jaw does actually open more. The lazier, not fully enunciated version that we tend to use more often than not, the jaw will still open slightly, um, but nowhere near as much, okay? A. Ah. Ah, ah, ah. That's how we usually do ah. We don't say ah. Okay. Did you see the cat? No. Did you see the cat? Cat. Okay. Um, so uh, you want to keep a mind, uh, an eye on that as well. Build the full versions first. And then the lazy versions are just a matter of, say, using the lips less. 
um, using the jaw less if the if the jaw does move like for for an ah, um, and not going fully into the sound with the tongue, you're going to end up a little bit farther back on that transition point, still within the range of the sound. You don't want to leave the sound, but you want to get just far enough into the sound to where it still sounds like the same sound. It just doesn't sound fully clear. So instead of e, you get like e e e, still a good e sound. Instead of e, you get like e e e, still a good e sound, right? Um, so that's another part of it too. But anyway, it's a lot for you to, to work with. Um, again, it's it's a little over, all over the place. Um, but when I make the lesson, I'm going to solidify it. I've actually been thinking since I've gotten this far, um, I've been thinking about making, starting to make a, like some content for those first four front vowels and these this two initial consonant clusters, start building some words. Um, so I might start jumping into that uh, relatively soon. Um, but then I'd hit a wall and I wouldn't have more content for you guys again uh, until I get farther with more people. So, yeah. Uh, Dungeon Master, oh my God, what was that? That person's name in chat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, in Beneath the Waves, uh, would you say it like stop dental T into dental D? Or would you go from a voiceless TH to a dental D? I know you can just look both regular THS. Okay, beneath the waves, beneath the waves. Yeah, so one option is to uh, the, the um, so it's beneath, which is voiceless, the is voiced. So one would be a dental T, the other would be a dental D. You can go into that position, sort of stop it. Um, just kind of hold it for a second uh, and then push out the D version instead of the T version. Beneath the, beneath the, beneath the, yeah, not a problem. Um, in fact, if you're speaking a little more quickly, you can kind of just completely drop the, the dental T altogether because it's the same position um, and just go straight into a dental D beneath the, beneath the, beneath the, beneath the waves, beneath the waves, beneath the waves. That's also possible, but you need a certain amount of speed for that. Uh, or would you go from a voiceless TH to a dental D? Beneath the waves, beneath the waves, beneath the waves. That might happen, but that's a lot harder to do. It's a lot harder to do. Um, possible, but I would, I, I would say no, just as like a general guide. Seriously, guy, seriously, do you have nothing better to do? Chris, he's probably loving my reactions. Um, I would just like to completely ignore him, but I'm not going to let this stuff just linger in my chat. Um, IDs are on this channel. Apparently, that doesn't do anything. But <sighs> reported. Thank you. Yes. Um, there's even more options, Finn. Uh, well, Finn knows what he's talking about. Yeah, uh, he knows the other options. Uh, but yes, uh, moving on. Uh, thanks on the face to explanation. I've been wondering for a long time. There's no diphthongs. Yeah, we haven't gotten to the diphthongs yet. <laughs> um, you can also imagine though for diphthongs, right? You don't want to touch diphthongs until you have the center of gravity. Because now, not only are you doing one sound, right? And you need to practice going, whether it's from a uh to e, e to o, uh, or whether it's from like k uh to e while keeping that center of gravity uh, intact, you need to practice holding that mouth posture going from sound to sound, right? And then building it in. Once you get into diphthongs, not only do you have one sound, but you have another sound at the end of, of the combination, and you have to hold the center of gravity through the whole thing that's a lot harder. <laughs> so you shouldn't even think about diphthongs of any kind, the regular diphthongs, the R colored vowels, or the L colored vowels should not even be in your mind, right? Don't, don't try to do like E and then ear and then eel as like one combination with the mouth posture. Don't even think about it. Um, that's, that's going to be later. Definitely gonna be later. Get the mouth posture first. 
uh, or start building that mouth function first. Um, did you, did you, no, I was like, why there's each vowel and why no diphthongs? Quickly realize that. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you think about Kuna? You ask me this every time. I still haven't watched it. <laughs> I'm not gonna just magic. I don't. I don't have time to watch it. <laughs> I like. I really love Japanese culture. Um, I've seen some Japanese, like some old Japanese movies before. I like them, but I do not have the time. Um, the most I have time for is like if I get home at like 10, 11 o'clock at night, and I'm hungry. <laughs> While I'm eating, I'll watch an episode of anime. And that is like, I don't want to make it sound worse than it is, but essentially that's kind of like, that's like my me time. <laughs> like before I go to bed, because I'm, whether I'm working on a video or I'm teaching a class or I'm you know, doing my other job, um, almost all day from the time I wake up until the time I go to bed, I'm working on something. Um, so obviously, I mean, you could say, okay, well, editing the video, yeah, that takes time and, you know, it is working, but, you know, some people would debate if that's a job, <laughs> but in a way I'm kind of working like at least 12 hours a day, uh, between the different things that I have to do. And so I, I don't really have the time to sit and watch like a whole movie and I'm not going to sit and watch a movie in different pieces. <laughs> um, so I will put it on my watch list. I will watch it eventually. But if you keep asking me, I'm just gonna give you the same answer. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> Apparently you really want me to watch it. <laughs> um, you need it and do it 100% perfectly. So now gravity and 100% first, then you'll have to get the first part. And then you have to figure out how to glue it together. Well, Dungeon Master is um, Dungeon Master is one of the people I'm working with, and he's also doing a little bit of his own thing, to an extent, um, kind of playing with things, exploring some things. Uh, but yeah, tell me some stupidity. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> Yeah, what what's up with the 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 name? By the way, anyway, I'm kind of wondering. It reminds me of like Kiki's Delivery Service, but it's stupidity. So it's like, why why the name? You don't have to explain if you don't want to, but it, it is curious. It's interesting. Um, relatable millennial solo life experience. I don't know. Me time on YouTube or anime sites while eating. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, we do a little bit of trolling, yeah. Well, we're we're just about out of time, and it looks like there's only two people who left here anyway. Um, so, and he's back. Let's see, are you changing your name at all? Yeah, I see you put a question mark instead of an exclamation point. Overpriced Tinder instead of then we're in. Okay. Yeah, hide. You're going to get the same thing. I, I mean, I get it, guy, if, you know, you keep wanting to do this, or maybe you're a bot and whoever created you is just having so much fun. Um, it, it really doesn't bother me that much. And I'm not just saying that. Like, it really doesn't. I, I really do not care. Um, the only thing I care about is trying to keep my stream a little clean and not offensive. So I can't just ignore it. Um, so maybe you can, you know, get your rocks off on that, I guess. A mild annoyance. You're, you're, you're just a pest. Like, that's all you are. You're, you're, you're a pest. And pests are swept away and then ignored. So you're not doing much. You're really not doing much. Um, I'll just keep doing the same thing. I don't care. I'll do it over and over again. Uh, probably a pun on terrible DoorDash post being screen you. Um, I was about to say, I'm glad you didn't spam me. So, yeah, <laughs> see, you didn't spam, and so somebody else decided that they had to spam. <laughs> uh, three times reported. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the same person, but they're they're changing the name a little bit, and yeah, um, 
I know other people have to deal with it too, so oh well. Not too big of a deal. Um, I know, right? Okay, so I'm going to go, guys. Um, I have to finish editing. I have other things to do today as well, but I do have to try to finish editing the uh, Fall Rise Intonation lesson today, which is going to be a little tight because I didn't realize how many visuals I was going to add to this one, um, which is not like it's all visuals, but there's more than usual. Check the Agelis document. I'll try to find it. Agelis. I don't know if you put anything about Agelis. I don't see it in chat. I don't remember that. Um, if you if you put a link, then it it didn't post because <laughs> YouTube won't let you post links. It only lets me post links. Uh, in DM. Oh, okay, I got it. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go, guys. Thank you very much. Um, next week, more questions. Hang out. We'll be here again. 11 o'clock. 11.30. Not 11 o'clock. 11.30 Sunday, California time. I will see you guys then. Have a great week. And um, hopefully I can get two or three more intonation lessons out. I really want to kill this course. <laughs> Just like finish it up. So Fernando, ciao. Yes. Have fun. Yes. Stay safe. Blah, blah, blah. See you next time.